We'll get going in just two minutes. There you go. I am. I think it might be the lavalier. I'm going to see if we can get it set. Taking them off. That's why there were five chairs. Yes. I was extra prepared. You were, of course. All righty. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out here tonight after what was a gorgeous day here in the Adirondack North Country. I was so blessed to be able to go out in the sunshine and welcome all of you to the Wild Center. We're so thankful to be hosting this amazing panel discussion tonight, uh, which Seth McGowan has pulled together. He's the head of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, a wonderful partner and leader in totality and Tupper, all of our community-wide events. We're so fortunate to live in a wonderful community where we've all come together across all sectors to plan what is an amazing weekend for everyone here. So thank you for getting up here and making it, truly. Now, that is all of my role here this evening. I'm turning it over to the experts who you're all here to see, and I'm here to learn as well. And just a round of applause. Thank you all. Thanks, Leanne. And uh, we really do appreciate the Wild Centers uh, hosting this tonight. Uh, we did a, a talk here last night also, Dr. DeLuca. And uh, we're, we're just uh, enjoying being partners uh, in this whole thing uh, with not just the Wild Center, but the Arts Center and the library, the school district, the town, the village, Roost. Uh, it really is a, a great opportunity for everybody to join together and create something for not just for Tupper Lake even, but for the Adirondacks. So, yes, my name is Seth McGowan. I'm the president of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory here in Tupper Lake. And I'd just like to take a poll. Would you please raise your hand if you, have, if you know uh, before this moment that uh, the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory uh, existed and is located in Tupper Lake? Just raise your hands. That is awesome. We have done a tremendous amount of outreach. I see two hands from this one girl over here. They're great, thank you. Um, we have done a tremendous amount of outreach, and one of the things that I'm trying to track, honestly, is um, how much that outreach is actually reaching folks. And when I started this tour, um, oh, you know, a year ago or whenever it was, when I asked that question of a community, you know, maybe uh, in Old Forge or maybe in Indian Lake, wherever, uh, rarely would a hand go up. And then as I would go from community to community 
And now I, I, I want to say that I've done 58 presentations in communities throughout the Adirondacks. Um, I, I know Elaine has done just a tremendous 13 also. Uh, 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 Eileen O'Donohue from St. Lawrence University, a board member of ours, Elaine is as well. We've just been all over the place. And um, so now when I go to a community that I haven't been to anymore and I say, Do you, have you heard of us? The answer is just like it is here. Almost every hand goes up. And that's our goal, is to sp spread the word of astronomy. That's, that's, our, uh, th that's why we exist. I, I know uh, this weekend it feels like we exist just for eclipses. But there is so much more to what we do. Uh, we travel to schools. We do community outreach. Um, we, we do our online lectures. We're in the process of designing a planetarium that will be paired with our uh, observatory on Big Wolf Road here in Tupper Lake. A rare occurrence. Typically, you'll find a planetarium in the middle of a city like Boston or New York or Rochester. Um, and a planetary and an observatory, you know, uh, the best ones at the top of a mountain someplace where uh, the sky is uh, thin and uh, you get to see beautiful views without a whole lot of light pollution. Well, in our case, we'll have the dark skies of the Adirondacks, which we're uh, working to preserve and promote. Uh, but now we'll have a planetarium also. So we'll be a daytime and nighttime. We'll be, we'll be open 24 hours a day as far as I'm concerned. So that'll be fun. Anyway, on to tonight's, uh, uh, tonight's talk. What, what I intend this to be is a f fairly informal conversation between uh, the great minds in solar astronomy and uh, in heliophysics and, and our audience. As, as I said before a million times, um, our, our goal is to sort of demystify the universe for people. And I lead that often by saying, you know, I, I was a music teacher, I was a, a, a school administrator and a teacher for my entire career, and, you know, it just sort of proves that you don't need to have a, an advanced degree in astrophysics to uh, understand and appreciate the universe. Well, in their cases, it doesn't hurt either, you know, so... Um, so uh, I, I'm, the, uh, I'm the living example of how involved and how appreciative of the universe someone could get without having that advanced degree. And what we plan to do tonight is to uh, talk about the past, uh, a little bit about the present in astronomy and, uh, and, in, uh, and what's, what's to come in the future of astronomy from everyone on the stage's unique perspective. And um, we'll, we'll kind of go from there. And I guess I would invite dialogue. That's, that's sort of the thing. This, this is not intended to be presentation style. Uh, we have other uh, opportunities for that throughout the weekend. This is really intended as outreach to answer questions, to just have discussion with the folks who look up at the sky every day and say, hey, I wonder what that is. So, um, so with that, uh, you know my background. Um, I, you know, uh, born in the Bronx, the the, you know, the center of light pollution. That's what that was, and it was not until I was in my 40s until I saw a presentation by one of the founding members of the Adirondack Sky Center, along with uh, Mr. Tim Muller in the audience here, and Mark Staves, uh, who's probably at the Roloff setting up a, a radio telescope for tomorrow. Um, Gordy Duval who was a physics teacher at the high school when I was the principal of the elementary school, came and did a presentation for the fourth graders. And that being my level of astronomy knowledge, I sat in on that and I was mesmerized. Part of it was Gordy, uh, you know, and, uh, but part of it was the idea that, holy mackerel, this is going on up there and I, I got to get involved. So I did. And, you know, now I'm the president, you know, that's just how it goes. I don't know how that happened exactly, but that's how it, that's how it went. So that's my background. Again, no science courses, no science background, music teacher, school teacher, school administrator, that's it. Um, so if a guy like me from the Bronx can do it, uh, everybody in the universe can do it. So uh, with that, we're going to just pass along the mics and we'll uh, let everybody kind of give you their background and their, their slant on the universe and then we'll, we'll kind of go into the, uh, to the past a little bit. All right. Um, hello, I'm Seth Redfield. I'm You're not related. No. <laughs> Double Seth, Seth squared up here. Um, 
I'm a professor of astronomy at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And um, my advanced degree was just an excuse to keep doing what I loved to think about, which was planets and stars and space. Um, my uh, interest, uh, I think, started from my town's uh, observatory that I would visit as a kid. So I want to encourage everyone to support the Adirondack Sky Center. Uh, as a young person, I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, I would, ever, you know, they were open twice a month, and I loved going, uh, looking through the telescopes, uh, looking at the moon and the stars and the planets, um, and it really piqued my interest. And so uh, I was always interested in math and physics, so I went on uh, and did that as an undergraduate. Um, I went to Tufts University, and I also got a bachelor's of music from the New England Conservatory of Music. At the time, I was interested in both music and astronomy. Um, and then about halfway through, uh, I did a summer research project in Tucson, Arizona at the National Solar Observatory. Um, and I worked with a mentor, Charlie Lindsay, uh, who um, my project, uh, this was before we had spacecraft that could see the other side of the sun. So right now, you know, for a long time, we could just see the side of the sun facing us and we see the sunspots. Did everyone see the sunspot on the sun today? The sun has this really beautiful sunspot. You'll be able to see it tomorrow uh, around the eclipse too. But these sunspots uh, can trigger flares and, and solar activity that can actually impact the Earth. So it's really important to know when a big one's coming around the corner, so to speak. And so my project was uh, working with him to try and estimate um, uh, star sunspots on the far side of the sun. I was just floored with that project. I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. Um, I loved being in that environment of an observatory where there were astronomers working on all these exciting projects, and I was just hooked. So um, I finished my uh, bachelor's degree in astronomy, but also music, but I knew kind of halfway through I was going to try and continue to be an astronomer. And I, was, I went to the University of Colorado uh, for my PhD. I was a postdoc in Austin, Texas. Um, and then I came to Wesleyan. Uh, my research is involved in um, exoplanets. Uh, so there's a planets around other stars. Uh, just in our lifetimes, just in the last 30 years, we've discovered thousands of them. So instead of speculating that there may be planets out there, we can point to specific stars, and we can tell you that there are planets around them. We can tell you what size they are. Some of them are Earth size. We can tell you what they look like around their star. And I take spectra of these planets uh, using telescopes in space and uh, here on the ground uh, to try and study what their atmospheres uh, are made of. molecules are, are in that atmosphere. And I'm really intrigued by this question of, is there life elsewhere in the universe? And I think we're, we live at a really special time uh, where we may answer that question sometime soon. Uh, we use uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which can observe uh, nearby uh, exoplanets. Uh, and I work on that data to try and measure the molecules. Some of those molecules may be associated with life. Uh, oxygen, methane, ammonia, these are all molecules that are um, abundant in strange fractions here on the Earth because we have such a rich biosphere that has impacted us. So that's my background and what I work on. Hi. I'm, my name is Elaine Fortin, and I'm Canadian. Uh, I grew up just across the river in Ontario. I went to Queen's University for my undergraduate program, and I, and I majored in statistics and mathematics. But I, my, one of the elective classes there that I took was astronomy. And I thought, oh my god, <laughs> I wish I had started with this stuff. I loved it. So then I went on and had a career in business, uh, but I kept taking astronomy courses on the side. 
And then I had a, after getting laid off in Canada in 1996, uh, we had a, a motivational speaker come and talk and say, if there's ever been anything in your life that you would really like to do, now's the time. And I thought, really? So I put my feelers out. I was a ham radio operator, so I, I put my feelers out through that community. And I had a friend down in Arecibo, the big radio telescope in, in Arecibo. And he said, they're hiring over in, uh, at the Harvard Smithsonian for, uh, Center for Astrophysics. So I got it. I, I tried, and I got in there. And I was like, oh my god, I've come home. And I just loved this place. Although I was in business, I also got my foot in the door in the science side. And that's where I met, met Ed. Uh, and uh, I worked in uh, on some of the space uh, the projects for the for some of the space telescopes and and uh, in uh, uh, doing mo mostly the UVCS the uh, ultraviolet coronagraph spectrometer on the SOHO spacecraft that went up in 1995 before I even was hired. So that was my first experience of finding finding my dream job. And, um, but I got laid off from there. They, they had to cut, cut back again. I thought, oh my gosh, but I kept my foot in the door and I stayed there for another six years part-time and loved all, every minute of it. I continued taking courses at Harvard. I got my master's in information technology and every time I had to, to write a paper, well, it was about astronomy, you can imagine. So I got to understand the, the communications systems, the detailed communication systems, how somebody at a computer in a control center on earth can talk with well, the whole network of how that information that that's the, the commands go to the space the telescope somewhere a million miles away even and how that can make a change in what the action is taking place on that spacecraft and then how information from that that telescope that gets recorded and such and is transmitted back down, and generally through the deep space network. Those three humongous sites of, of, of humongous uh, teles radio telescopes around the world. And then that, how that information c comes back through a network, highly encrypted, into the, back to the control centers, and then into the, the hands of the, the processors, who turn these FITS files, these files of data, into beautiful images that go up on the web and are used in, in courses, in, in a, a astronomy courses around the world. So I, I got this privilege to get this under the covers look at astronomy. And when uh, I retired from there, I, uh, we moved to upstate um, Vermont, actually, and when I became a farmer, I became a, 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 a sheep and a sheep farmer, where because I loved wool and I loved fiber arts, and um, the, but but I, I, there was an astronomy club that had been defunct, so I the, uh, the high school teacher said they had an, they had an observatory on, at the high school that hadn't been used in years. I said, well, let's let's do something about this. Let's let's get this going. So there was just a few of us. We grabbed some other people in the community. We did got some fundraising, and we refurbished the old telescope, and we started having regular programming. And I got to talk again. And yes, yeah, you can tell I like to talk, but only about astronomy. <laughs> and then there's this program called the Solar System Ambassador Program. I heard about. This is run by the Jet Propulsion Lab down in Caltech in Pasadena, and it's funded by NASA. And so I applied every, every fall. They op open up the application period, and people can apply to become one of these. But you have to prove yourself. And they check all your, your references, and then they say, yes, we'll, we'll take you on. We'll, and you, they give you some trainings, and then they give you the blessings to say, go out into the world and have a great time telling the world about astronomy. Let this passion grow. And so this is, the, this is my fourth year I'm doing this now, and it's up to me to, and, and my fellow 2,000 solar system ambassadors to go around and get our, our teaching, teaching uh, or speaking engagements. So every time there's a, an event, the eclipse, uh, when the James Webb Telescope was launched, when the uh, Mars Perseverance and uh, the uh, Ingenuity landed on Mars, all these events, I 
get to get this inside information and slides from that, from NASA, from JPL, and go out and present to libraries and school groups and clubs. And uh, I've been having the time of my life in my retirement. Uh, and I've also been to the top of, of Mount Lemmon and done the astronomy camp. People, it's not just for kids. Astronomy camp. I want to put a plug. If kids love astronomy, try really hard to get them to an astronomy camp. Now with COVID over, these camps are opened up again. There are, there's several across the United States, uh, some in other countries, but let's concentrate here. I would uh, love to see people who come to these talks actually carry it on and get to, into one of these, some, these uh, astronomy camps. Uh, so I think I, that's about it for me, and I'll pass it to Ed. Thanks, Elaine. <clears throat> so um, I'm actually also from the Bronx. Um, and uh, I, uh, as a child, spent some time taking astronomy classes in the basement of the Natural History Museum. And that was a bit of a hike. Um, you know, the transportation system in New York City works pretty well, but it's, it's, it's a ways from the Bronx to Manhattan. Um, and then there was another uh, a small um, museum that had an astronomy program up in Yonkers, which was uh, substantially closer. And so I, I spent a, a fair bit of time doing, you know, observing in the evenings. And uh, there was some sort of classes where the classes were really very, very, very informal. I mean, it's like people, and people of multi-generational people. So I was, I was, you know, the young, uh, I probably was in high school and maybe even in, in middle school at that time. Um, and there were, you know, uh, adults who were also interested in astronomy. And that was really, I, I enjoyed that. And that was, um, I think, very educational. Um, one of the things I think coming out of, of the discussions here is is really the sense of community and um, you know the professional astrophysics community is very small. I think there may be five thousand astronomers in the AAAS directory or something like that. American Astronomical Society, right? And if you go to if you go to three or four meetings, you've kind of met everybody, right? And so um, the, you know Charlie Lindsay I worked with in Hawaii. Right, I mean, I know, you know, so there are these overlaps in relationships of, of, with people even. And that, that is, is also true, I think, within the amateur astronomy community as well, that there is, you know, the communities are, are, are more perhaps isolated, but, um, but they're very strong and they're really, generally, everybody is just interested in helping you understand something, right? And that, that, I, that I think is, is one of the delights of the, of the field. Um, it's really, you know, it's not competitive at that in the sense of people trying to demonstrate how brilliant they are compared to you. I haven't had that experience in the, uh, in the, in I don't know. So I, I did my PhD in the University of Colorado. Um, and I, um, when I went to graduate school was really very interested in the mathematics behind uh, physical processes. So, you know, as it, it was uh, fluid dynamics and magnetohydrodynamics were really what I was interested in. How do you generate magnetic fields in a spherical object, creating the magnetic fields in the sun as the one that was most, had the most observational constraints. And so built, building mathematical models was what, was what I did. Um, for the early part of my career and extended into, into um, the work that I ended up doing at the Center for Astrophysics. The, um, the challenge is that a lot of the times the, the models are not well constrained by observations, particularly the interior structure models. And so I did get dragged into to studying magnetic fields in the corona, which is very, very, very well observed. And during the course of my career, the observations of, from space of the solar corona um, just grew dramatically. Um, I was at the uh, Institute for Astronomy in Hawaii, where I was still doing uh, my, my mathematical modeling things, and, and Leon Golub uh, came out to give a talk. And um, he had known a person I did my postdoctoral work with, Bob Rosner, in Chicago. And so Bob Rosner sort of pointed him up in my direction because he was looking for someone to do sort of the uh, uh, 
theoretical aspects of the instrumentation work that Leon was, was building at that time. And Leon Golub has gone on to, you know, build the vast majority of solar EUV imaging telescopes that are in space. I mean, it's just remarkable. And, you know, working with, with him over the decades has been, has been a delight. And you meet all these other people. And, and he doesn't, you know, so he's an instrumentation person. His background is in high energy physics. Um, but even, even Leon doesn't actually build things, right? Because if you're going to put something in space, you don't want the scientists doing the building, right? We have, we have professionals for this. And so this is part of the community now, is that in order to actually get anything done, you have to get the engineers involved, you have to get the optical engineers, the mechanical engineers, the electrical engineers, the, compo the programming people, computer science people, and you've got to get the budgeting people and the uh, HR people because one of the one of the characteristics of all of these projects, which is Elaine has, has noted, is that the funding level rises very steeply, but you don't have the staff, and it takes six or eight months to get the staff. But the funding level, depending on on how you know, the fortunes at, at NASA goes, the funding level then decreases, and suddenly you've got the staff without the funding. And and this is this is kind of a, you know, it's a it's. It's an exciting, let's put it that way, it's an exciting way to live. If you're working on, in the soft money business, um, having multiple instrumentation projects sort of levels it out. If you were just trying to do this as, you know, doing theory and modeling, it's kind of a three-year proposal cycle and, you know, kind of winning proposals all the time to keep yourself employed over three years is, you know, there is some, some mold of the dice there and you're never gonna, you know, you'll end up shortfall. But it's been a wonderful career. I, I retired uh, April a year ago, um, but I'm still collaborating with the, uh, the group that, that Leon and I helped build in solar physics there, and uh, some of the people I hired are now principal investigators of a small explorer program, and they won, she won the phase A, Kathy Reeves, and uh, we're working on the concept study report, which is essentially NASA gives you money to write a proposal, and then there's a down selection of four people that have won at that level, and then one gets to go forward. So this will happen in about a year. We'll know whether that's going on. So, but it's, you know, I've, I've had a wonderful time, and, and uh, you know, there's, there's always some stress in these things, but it's, uh, it's been very rewarding for me. So I'm going to use this microphone for a second. We have multiple microphones up here, but we're sharing the same one. It's a, you know, it's part of the community. You know, that's the thing that we're all talking about. So, what I, I want to kind of turn this uh, this panel uh, upside down a little bit and see. Um, we want to basically break uh, break the, the following discussion into three. I would say approximately ten minute segments. One uh, in the past, one current, and one for the future. And what I'd like to ask uh, for a little audience participation here, I'd like for somebody to uh, ask a question uh, directed at, at whomever or any subject or even a generic subject about something that's maybe happened over the past you know, 100 years, maybe within your lifetime or maybe something that you've heard about that you might be interested in, in hearing a little bit more about, you know, hey, how did that happen? Or what was that? What, what decisions, what discussion was there around that? So uh, I'm going to uh, allow that for the audience uh, to, to chime in on that. So who's got, a, who's got a thought about something that's happened in the past? I, I see a, a very small little hand way over there. OK. Uh, the question is, uh, for, and I'm saying for the folks online, um, uh, welcome, by the way. Uh, do, you, do you guys wear NASA shirts? Are you NASA people? What happens, you know, uh, are you, you know, yeah. Well, I have NASA pajama pants that I like to wear. <laughs> Thank you. <man. laughs> 
as a gift for my family. Um, I, that is a great question, and I, I've noticed uh, NASA has a lot of um, street cred, a lot of swag. A lot of people want to wear NASA stuff, and that just shows you how much um, public interest there is in space, how involved NASA is in its outreach and its communication uh, to the public. Uh, you don't see many national agencies on sweatshirts or sneakers <laughs> or sweats. Cool. The IRS has shirts, though. <laughs> so go NASA. I do have a NASA shirt. I had it on today, but it was so cold. I had my coat over it. But uh, I do wear it when I do my presentation. System ambassadors. But yeah, NASA's, NASA clothing is cool. And it doesn't matter where you wear or I have a jacket from, uh, I had taken a, an x-ray course in down at the, um, in uh, Chincote, Maryland. Where, what's the name of that? The, the, uh, oh. the NASA base down there. Um, um, Goddard, Scott, no, no. Down uh, where they shoot you. The the rockets, the, um, it's not anyway, the black, the black wallops, black wallops, black. wallops. So I had this really cool sh jacket from there, and uh, I was wearing it on the subway one time in Boston, and somebody asked me if I'd been in space recently. <laughs> <laughs> it was just such a cool question. <laughs> but yeah, NASA swag is pretty fun. Yeah, I. I, I don't actually have any, any NASA uh, attire, um, but it is, I have purchased it for other people as gifts. So, um, I, so it is, it, it's fun. And NASA legitimately does an excellent job of, you know, un understanding their role in, in sort of bringing science to people. And they have, some they expend resources to do it, and and they have really excellent people who, who help help with that project. So you're not just reliant on on people like myself to try to to do this because different people have different specialities. But yeah, NASA swag is fun, and, and I think it. Nobody, no one's going. No one at NASA is going to object to anybody wearing NASA swag. And it's certainly a great uh, promotional thing, and you know, public uh, public acceptance and so forth. Uh, did I see a hand here? Yes, sir. Um, what's your opinion the United States that the every store in America? Okay, so uh, <laughs> yes. So uh, the question is directed at uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, the, the question is, uh, you know, what's the opinion on, you know, the, the uh, American, uh, the United States government not really supporting the, the space exploration like they have in previous decades and so forth? I, I, think, I think NASA's point of view, and I'm not sure that it's the correct one, but their notion is they wanted to transition from the government essentially kind of controlling through through corporations this the have the launch business and uh and just facilitating commercial launch vehicles right their view was if we let nasa is going to buy launch vehicles and if you can provide launch vehicles that have, meet our specifications, we'll buy them from anybody. We're not just going to buy them from Boeing or, or Lockheed Martin or the uh, United Space Alliance, right? We'll buy them from anybody who meets the criteria. And, you know, and it, and it did, that may, may have had an impact. The bigger impact is a lot of companies found it really profitable to be putting objects in space, in low Earth orbit. And so, they were going to, you know, they were going to launch things regardless, right? There was a commercial value in producing rockets that could put satellites in orbit um, uh, for commercial purposes, and, and there was money to be made, and so, so that was driving a lot of the commercial launch thing, and NASA also comes into it. Now, 
nobody really has a commercial interest in putting things on the moon or sending things to Mars, right? That's kind of only the nation states that, that have an interest in doing that at this point. So heavy launch vehicles are subsidized by the government, but you know there are there's competition within corporations in, in the United States. I think you know the Falcon, you know, the SpaceX has a has a heavy launch vehicle that they're pushing. United Space Alliance, which is tied pretty closely to Marshall Space Flight Center, has a you know has their uh, Artemis program. So I, I mean I think that's kind of how it's evolved. But a lot of it was driven kind of irrelevant. NASA was not particularly relevant to the commercial viability of putting putting lots of small satellites in and, and just think how cool th those images are when SpaceX shoots a rocket up and the, the two, the, the rockets themselves come back and land. Have you seen that? You've seen those videos? You haven't? Somebody has. Yeah. So where NASA's always ended up in the ocean and generally that's where they stayed. But at least the people at SpaceX were able to find a way to reuse their their hardware. That was fantastic. NASA didn't do it. I, another question, right? So the question is, uh, uh, again, for our online audience, if, uh, if this transition period uh, has resulted in NASA being able to support uh, other things that they were not yet able to do. I wish. So uh, <laughs> the, all the missions we've talked about and mentioned up here are a pretty small fraction of NASA's budget. Um, this is something I do in my classes. It's not the most fun, but it's worth uh, looking at the pie chart of NASA's budget and what they spend money on, what fraction of our federal budget NASA is on. We were talking earlier about the outreach and uh, that NASA has. Every, essentially, all Americans know about NASA. So that often leads to kind of an inflated sense of what NASA's budget is, which is actually, um, I mean, it's dwarfed by the film industry that we enjoy. Um, so uh, I think, um, I, I'm actually, I think there's still a lot uh, put into, uh, as Ed was saying, the efforts for human spaceflight to the moon and Mars. That's still a, uh, quite large. I think the science part and the development of um, telescopes in space that are funded by NASA Fairly, fairly constant. Over the course of time with the International Space Station, there have been over 30,000 inventions from that station that have co brought about improvements to human life on the planet. Things from your cell phones to your, uh, oh gosh, there's so many things. Um, uh, I think the, 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 the uh, cochlear transplants, uh, there's, uh, how bacteria, the creation of uh, wheel bearings, the, the round, the, the perfectly round wheel bearings that they can do in space. And things that they've learned in space that they carry back to science and it goes into private industry. Because that information, what NASA does is public. It's paid by, by, by taxpayer dollars and it, it goes back to the public. It's open source. And so that information spawns the industries in America to grow and to provide inventions and things that help help physicians do their jobs or uh, create artificial knees and things like that. 30,000 inventions have happened. And it's, 
that's not that program's not going to stop. So even though the space station is coming to its like kind of end, there's 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 going to be it's going to go on. That whole program is going to stay. I think in my lifetime for sure. I hope it's a couple of decades more. Uh, and just a, a quick note. Um, another aspect of the NASA um, space science missions that you know a lot of the instrumentation is built by um, aerospace companies. We have colleagues at, at Lockheed Martin, colleagues at what used to be Ball, is now BAE. Um, and the aerospace companies spend a lot of resources on their instrumentation there because they can talk about the scientific results from NASA missions and attract interesting other engineers. Like this, this company's doing really neat stuff because look at these, these, cool, these cool instruments that are doing this amazing stuff in space. And they have a vast other army of DOD spending uh, stuff that they're doing, analogous, similar, similar skill set, but they can't talk about it at all, right? So, so it's, it's useful for them as a recruiting tool they're providing, you know, it's useful for us in the science community because we get these amazing engineers, and it and it's a training process. But you know, you, it's it's kind of how do you do? You can't really do outreach if all of your stuff is classified. So having having a, an ability to do outreach through cool science stuff that you're either putting on Mars or your Mars rovers or a, a remote sensing or in situ spets, sensing in in uh, harsh environments. All of that stuff, infrared optics, all of that stuff is, and and it comes back. It's it, you know, there's a term for this. It's all dual use, right? So you know. Got a question over here? Yes, sir. You may have struck gold on this one. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, the, the question is, uh, unfortunately, I, uh, my time limit might be to, uh, to interfere. Um, You've got 30 seconds. So <laughs> there are, um, it's a huge question in solar physics. Uh, uh, observing the corona, which as you, the, the, the point was made that the solar corona is typically million to, if in flares, 10 million degrees. Celsius, the surface is 6,000 degrees Celsius, and typically, if you have a a cool thing, you're not transporting energy to the hot thing, right? If you have a hot thing and a cool thing, the hot thing is going to. But that's in in the solar atmosphere. You've got these wonderful magnetic fields, and the magnetic fields are generated inside the sun. They produce they project through the surface of the sun and out into interplanetary space, and they are a conduit for storing energy from surface motions in the convection zone in the, in the corona and releasing energy through magnetic reconnection in these tangling processes and producing explosive events that actually propel these coronal mass ejections into interplanetary space. So it is this structure and the, the, the morphology, the structure that you see in the corona is controlled by those magnetic fields. The plasma is tied to the field lines in the corona, and so the magnetic field kind of controls all of the dynamics. There are wave processes that can be generated on the magnetic fields, which then can, uh, yeah, I'll get to you, can then um, cr uh, dissipate and, and generate energy to accelerate the solar wind as well. But instrumentation-wise, there's, um, I'm actually going to get, be giving a talk, I'll put a plug at 11 o'clock tomorrow at the, at the elementary school, where I'm going to talk about a couple of the, uh, the science uh, investigations that are happening in airplanes uh, observing the corona. And magnetic fields are always, always front and center in my mind. <laughs> All right, so uh, do we have another? The question is, 
Why is the NASA budget so low as opposed to other budgets, other government budgets, which seem excessively high? Well, these budgets are using the money that we've contributed as taxpayers. So please talk to your representative in the, the place that you live or your senator and uh, communicate to them, ask them that question, because these are the policy makers that uh, <clears throat> decide how we divide up that budget. I think that's a really excellent question. Um, one of the efforts that we've done to try and confront the budgetary issue is all of our communities have developed this concept called the decadal survey. And every decade, communities of scientists get together and we hash it out among ourselves about what our priorities uh, should be. So that even though we could always use more money, we can also provide advice on whatever budget levels get decided, this is how we as scientists feel that money should be spent. I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask that question tomorrow if you'll be around. Uh, we have a number of uh, Congress people, and both from state and from uh, uh, the U.S. Congress, coming to uh, Apollo Field tomorrow. So, if you are genuinely interested in uh, in answering that question, I'm not going to tell you who they are, and I don't want to f them to feel ambushed. But a voice like yours goes a long way. So. Um, so let, let's now shift to uh, present day. Uh, we've talked about some, some things that have happened, and we've kind of naturally transitioned into uh, what's, what's happening now in space. And, uh, I, and I want to kind of lead off the question before uh, I, I turn it to the audience, um, because we've talked a lot about launching satellites. And um, it, it feels to me, in looking at the models of the satellites that are out there, uh, and be doing astrophotography uh, myself, um, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to do a quality image without having streaks of satellites going through my images. And knowing what, uh, the, if you've seen the, the images of the number of satellites uh, approaching on, uh, on the Earth, it seems like in order to launch anything, you really just have to kind of thread the needle just to get out of, uh, you know, uh, beyond. So what, what do you think is going, what is the, what's, what's happening? Is there a cleanup mission? I mean, because there's things, there's little screws out there that if you hit, you know, going 25,000 miles an hour or whatever the International Space Station is traveling, uh, that, that can do some serious damage. So is there... Anything going on with that in terms of cleanup? Is there like a giant magnet scanning out there and pulling everything in? What's happening out there? I read about this just about two weeks ago. There is, I don't think it's, it's NASA, I think it was a private company that is planning to go up and do some, something which will attack the, the, the dead stuff and bring it down, either capture it or somehow bring it into a safe way of falling back to Earth. There is, because the, I, I don't know, is it, it's in the tens of thousands numbers of things up there. And maybe, I don't know, here's a ballpark figure. Half of them are still active. Maybe I would probably even less than half. But there is so much. And a lot of it is no bigger than my purse. It, it, there's, there's these things called CubeSats. A lot of technology has been miniaturized. So there's, there's, they're really tiny. And it gets so much of it. it it's, it's just like dust. There's so much. And whatever goes up has to come down. It's going to all get, it all comes down at some point. Just, you heard about the piece of, of the International Space Station that fell through somebody's roof last week in Florida. Did you hear about that? It went right through the house, two, right through two floors. It was about this big. And it was, it, they found out it was from the space station. There, there had been a, um, a, a, a little pod that went up to take the garbage back, but they couldn't get all the garbage in. So they said, well, we'll just put this out into a little, we'll just toss it out. And it'll, it'll, it'll fall back. It'll, it'll, it's all small stuff. It'll burn up in the atmosphere. But it didn't. And it went into low Earth orbit for a couple of years, apparently. And there's no control on this. This is just it's going to fall where it falls. Whereas the stuff that the space 
crafts that still have a little bit of fuel on them can go be, be commanded to come in into a controlled re-entry and then fall into like the Pacific or the Arctic or Antarctic oceans. But this other stuff where there's no control, it's going to come down and it's, it's happening. People hear about it more and more, things falling out of, out of the sky. Um, so yes, there is money. I haven't heard that NASA is spending money on it, but there is a private company that is coming up with ways of lassoing some of this stuff. Now the other thing is people think is that why aren't aren't there collisions if there's so much garbage up there? Well, all the stuff that still has fuel on it has devices on them that. Like on these, fa like our new, our newer uh, cars that have all these monitors, their sensors, it's beep, beep, beep. You're c somebody's coming up close to your on your way. They have d devices like that on them, and they can tell when they're getting close to another, another piece of garbage or another uh, spacecraft, so, and they can take the evasive action. Maybe I've lived in the Adirondacks too long, but I, you know, see on all of our campsites, bring it in, take it out. You know, that same, same kind of thing. All right, what, uh, what's going on these days out there that you were, you think about? Oh, well, boy, okay. Now, how much time do I have on that topic? Um, I, I, I'm proud to say that Tupper Lake is ahead of most Adirondack communities in, uh, in light pollution prevention and uh, we're taking further steps with the International Dark Sky Association to to bring our area into a, a dark sky category that's designated um, but I'll tell you as an uh, as a uh, an astronomer an amateur astronomer and astrophotographer light is the enemy right of, of and even on a on a moonlit night you know uh, Tim will tell you uh, it's it's like a, a galactic street lamp right over your head, and it's just shining brown. So any kind of light is uh, is the enemy, and and I think uh, it's it's really incumbent upon us as community members to uh, just like any other litter or trash or or anything uh, to be very steadfast with our you know conversation with our local governments about decreasing and controlling light pollution. Um, and there are some extremely uh, simple ways to do that. And in most cases, it's, it's the same cost or, or even cheaper to install light, uh, uh, you know, approved light uh, authorized, uh, I'm not coming up with the right words here, but, um, uh, and, and I want to just mention how uh, Tupper Lake is so, uh, is really ahead of the curve. There's a, there's a family building uh, a miniature golf course right down on the boulevard there across from the, from the water, right? And um, I, I happened to get a hold of, uh, it wasn't classified information, so, you know, but I got a hold of the specs that they had for their lighting, right? And um, I, I just drove down to them and I said, look, you know, we've got this observatory in town. We're trying to do something here with light pollution. Let's try to protect our community. And um, and and he said to me, "Well, you know, the 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 light fixtures that were on that spec are sitting in my garage, ready to be installed." And of course, my heart sank. But I got a phone call a day or two later from the lighting engineer that said that they were able to swap the lights out free of charge, to my knowledge, free of charge. Um, but the light fixtures were the same cost or maybe even a little cheaper. And they were uh, International Dark Sky uh, Association approved lighting um, to, to preserve the dark skies in Tupper Lake. It's that easy. It really is that easy. That was just a conversation with a gentleman building a golf, uh, a miniature golf thing. So it only takes a conversation sometimes to, uh, but it, it's at that stage. Um, there are, there were, and I believe there still are grants from New York State that will help communities replace their lights, uh, especially in uh, in existing uh, facilities like gas stations or other um, commercial businesses. Uh, New York State has granting for the the changing of those light systems. 
Certainly there's incentives uh, in, in construction for doing that uh, on, the, on the front end, uh, preserving uh, the, the dark skies uh, around. So uh, it, again, it, it's, it's so easy, but we have to think of it first. Uh, it, it's harder after the fact, except in this gentleman's case who was building this golf course. Uh, he just did it. He just did it. He, he was already done, but he undid it and corrected it, and it was, it was great. So, but the trick is to keep having the conversation, to keep it in front of everyone's mind, because people go to where it's dark to see the sky. Uh, it, it's called astrotourism. It's, it's an actual vocabulary word now we didn't hear of 10, 20 years ago. Now people are selecting their vacation spots based on where it's dark so that they can go see the stars. My time is up. I'll just add real briefly. Um, you get a real sense uh, here and other places, right, the sense of place that you have in the Adirondacks. Um, our sense of place includes the night sky, and that's something that a lot of humanity is losing here. A lot of citizens in the U.S. are losing that, that sense of place that they get from the night sky as it slowly, um, there's too much light pollution up there that we lose the Milky Way, we lose the constellation. Left with just a few bright stars. Again, I, I know it's a it's a passion of mine, but um, you know the same way we don't want to clear cut the Adirondacks of trees. Um, uh, one of our board members, Eileen O'Donohue from St. Lawrence University, refers to it as the wilderness above, and I think that that suits exactly the spirit that uh, that you're talking. Take the wind out of anybody else here. Uh, you got a question? Okay, so it's, uh, it's convention to the day before an eclipse not to discuss weather. <laughs> so next question. <laughs> no, uh, w uh, I'll, I'll take this if it's, if it's okay. Uh, having, <laughs> having some experience with the Adirondack weather, um, whatever they say, I, I don't believe it. Um, our good friend Gib Brown, from, uh, retired from WPTZ, long-term meteorologist, um, here has been emailing me sometimes twice a day on the forecast, starting about a month ago uh, <laughs> on what the forecast was. And, it, and, you know, he's been talking about the high pressure system that, that we need in place in order to keep the clouds away. But, you know, the, the fact is that um, there's a couple of things. One, in Tupper Lake, um, and I can tell you my experience has been that whatever they say, whatever time they say the clouds are going to start, you wait and it's actually two hours later. So if they say the clouds are coming in at, you know, four o'clock, it'll actually be six o'clock when the clouds actually come in. That's been my general experience. That's not always true, but um, the, the forecast for tomorrow, as the last time I looked, is that we will get through totality, and then as the partial, as it starts to end in the partial eclipse, w there's a forecast to get some clouds. My prediction, either that's going to happen or we'll get through the partial also on the other end of totality and, and we'll have a pretty good view. Unless something happens and I'm completely wrong, which is entirely possible because that's the Adirondack weather. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, I, I don't want to speak for everybody else here, but uh, being in a, uh, in a completely clouded over uh, 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 environment for a, 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 an eclipse, is not to be understated. It is a fascinating, very emotional, and, and sometimes frightening experience. So I'm not saying I'm hoping for that, but boy, that, you know, because of the instability in the atmosphere, you can get hail, uh, thunder, and lightning. You, can, you, you often get a, just a, a, a beautiful glow at the horizon because the sun is still shining outside of the clouds and bouncing up into the clouds, so you get this beautiful atmosphere around the horizon. The other effect, though, is that um, uh, we, we had actually, just during the partial eclipse in, uh, in October, uh, and that we were at the observatory, there was, there was many people there, and, um, and it was raining. And very often, again, because of the, the severe changes in the atmosphere, in the environment, remember that shadow is moving 2,500 miles an hour. 
So that changes fast, and it creates these very in, instable or unstable uh, conditions. Our experience for that was uh, all these downtrodden faces. They thought they were going to not see the, the partial eclipse. The clouds parted. It was like a biblical kind of a thing. You know, the clouds just opened up, and, and people were just joyous at the fact that, it was, that we were able to see the, uh, the partial eclipse in that case. So no matter what happens, it, it's going to be a fantastic event, and, um, and, and I'm not worried about the weather. Uh, from our standpoint, I don't want to speak for the Wild Center, but the eclipse itself is almost secondary. We have so many things going on, so many activities. We, we've got the NASA stream coming in. We're streaming back to NASA. We've got glass blowing here. We've got the silent disco still going, right? You know, all of that stuff is still happening. We've got talks, family activities. There's so much going on. Thankfully, we didn't have to do anything for the eclipse. It was just, you know, we didn't have to, we didn't have to plan for that. It was going to happen anyway. So I hope that answers your question and encourage you not to think about weather. That's, that's the thing. Yeah, behind. I can't believe we're that far into this talk without somebody bringing up black holes. <laughs> so, so the question is black holes, go. <laughs> um, so my course has become exoplanets, black holes, and how the universe began. Because those are the three <laughs> things people want to talk about. And it's absolutely right. I, um, black holes are these amazing things in our universe. Um, that are so dense that they collapse down into the singularity. Uh, and this has a great eclipse uh, connection. Uh, there is a scientist you may have heard of, Albert Einstein, who studied uh, and developed the theory of special and general relativity. And this uh, has to do with uh, what happens uh, near a massive object, like a black hole. Um, so things with mass, anything with mass, actually ends up warping space-time around it. Um, one of the tricky concepts uh, is uh, that time, uh, we often have to treat time as just another dimension of space, and so that's why you hear this term space-time, because um, mathematically uh, we have to treat them uh, as the same sort of entity kind of like, um, you know, the analogy is um, when you look at a, a three-dimensional object like a book, you can look at it from very, from different perspectives, but since we know that it's a three-dimensional object, we know that even though it looks different from different views, we know it's a book, you know, it's a three-dimensional book. Um, we, we don't experience time as a spatial dimension, so that's what makes it so difficult for us to conceptualize but we can just think of time as another dimension. So everything with mass warps uh, space-time. It's gonna warp um, uh, the path that light takes. Uh, so uh, Albert Einstein made this prediction, and the idea was like, well, we have this really massive object really close to us, the sun. If we could observe stars uh, that are behind the sun, you know, um, we should see their position shift or appear to shift because their path is being warped by the warp space-time around the sun. It's really hard to observe stars that are right next to the sun except during an eclipse. So tomorrow you're gonna see the brightest stars and the planets start to appear um, in the night sky. Actually in 2017 we saw a cloudy total eclipse, but we saw Jupiter and other stars come out uh, during that time. Even though we couldn't see uh, the sun itself, other parts of the sky were clear, and it was just amazing. Um, so there was an expedition in 1919 to uh, observe a solar eclipse uh, in South America. This was probably one of the first international collaborative scientific experiments to test Albert Einstein's theory. Uh, and so they, um, six months before the eclipse, they took a picture of st a star field uh, at night. 
And then six months later, uh, they observed this eclipse of the exact same star field, but now the sun was right in the middle of it, but it was blocked during the eclipse, and they could measure that the stars were offset. They, were, they looked like they were in a different position, not because they had moved, but because we were observing the warping of space-time around the sun. So that's, a, that's an example of how space is warped, uh, and then time also uh, gets warped in a similar way in that to different observers, time will appear to pass at a different speed. There, there. I'll also recommend, there was a book written a while ago uh, called Flatland, uh, and uh, many of you may know the, the book, uh, Life Changer for me, um, but uh, I, won't, I won't talk about that book, but Carl Sagan, uh, 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 an astronomy educator, you know, just a great, great guy, um, uh, did an explanation of Flatland, and, um, and it speaks to how we can how why why we can't perceive the the change in time in space time and why we can't perceive a fourth dimension and uh, it is by far the best explanation of how that all works and it really crystallized it in my mind so it, it's a video someplace but it's Carl Sagan talking about flatland and I, I guarantee that will you'll you'll be an expert in it after that <laughs> Uh, also, I should mention that in our star lab uh, in the gym at LP Quinn tomorrow, you'll get a preview of the star that you'll see in the sky during the eclipse. That's the show that we're doing uh, uh, all morning long. So uh, head up there and take a look at what the stars are that you'll see in the sky when the eclipse occurs. All right, more questions. Let's, uh, let's go here. Yep. What is the fuel on the uh, on the spacecraft? Get a question. Oh, I love rogue planets. Those are really interesting. Uh, a rogue planet is a planet uh, that's no longer orbiting a star. Um, and we know, uh, we know they're out there. In fact, uh, very, just in the last five years, uh, there have been two rogue comets that have streamed through our own solar system. So these aren't planets, but they're small cometary objects. But um, they're coming into the inner solar system, and we can measure very carefully how fast they're moving and where they're coming from. And at first, we thought they were just solar system comets but they were moving 
uh, much faster. And in fact, they're moving faster than the escape speed of our solar system. So by measuring the path of their, um, through, the solar, through our solar system, we knew that they weren't going to come back around. They're, they're streaming out. So, uh, and this is a result of gravitational interaction with objects. And this happens with stars as they're forming. It happens with black holes. Um, it happens with galaxies. As you, as you have objects interact with each other gravitationally, that gravitational force gets stronger as they get closer together. So you can have situations where objects can pass really close to each other and inject a lot of energy into their uh, uh, motion such that they will then escape uh, the system they were formed in. So we think that's how uh, planets may have been ejected, um, kind of voted off the island, so to speak, uh, of their solar systems. Uh, this, hap this may have happened in our own solar system. There's some evidence that Uranus and Neptune actually switched places with each other. So right now, Neptune is the most distant uh, giant planet in our solar system, but it except may for have, Pluto. Except for well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, there's a, a distant uh, dwarf planet named Pluto um, out there. I oh. speak for Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> it still exists. It does. <laughs> it's still there. It's still part of our family. Um, but uh, in that process of your uh, Neptune may have formed closer, and then a gravitational interaction may have switched their places and caused a little disruption in our solar system and may have ejected objects um, that may be streaming through other planetary systems uh, today. So. All right, so uh, let's, let's shift a little bit to, uh, we, we can take some more questions, but I, I wanna just sort of shift a little bit in our, in our last section uh, about the future. Um, they, they say that the, the, the first person to step foot on Mars has already been born. And that's, that's kind of a stunning concept when you think of it. Uh, it's, it's not going to be me, that's for sure, uh, but it, it may be somebody in this room. Um, I, I saw in Dr. DeLuca's presentation just last night a, uh, a slide, an animation, uh, not an animation, but an actual film or, or uh, movie of a uh, film from the uh, Parker Space Probe that uh, w was absolutely stunning, there, uh, just what, what's happening in there. So there's, there's things going on that are launching us into the future. We're, we're already talking about, and things are happening already. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what are the big things? What are the, you know, what are we, what are we talking about? What, what's the, nu the nuclear bomb that, uh, that's going to drop, do you think? What's the next thing? Um, from my point of view, I, I think it's this... Um, search for life in the universe. So I think that it's quite possible within our lifetimes that we find evidence uh, through atmospheric properties of an exoplanet that there's life on that planet. Um, we've gone a long time with just knowing one form of life, uh, and that's our own here on Earth. Um, and so I think this uh, question is perhaps the biggest scientific question of the next uh, 100 years, um, and we are on the cusp. So we have planets that, that are Earth-like, that are uh, at the right temperature, that liquid water can exist on their surface, so we, we are discovering those more and more. Uh, and with a new telescope, uh, the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, which on launch, the launch was so uh, perfect that they didn't have to use any of the fuel and what that means is that it's going to last almost uh, more than three times as long as they had originally planned, because they had planned, because um, it was dependent on the amount of fuel that they had available to them. So that telescope observes in the infrared, where we see the signatures, the fingerprints of molecules, uh, including uh, molecules associated with life. So for me, uh, that's the question that I'm really excited out and that I think may be answerable. Uh, uh, the Artemis program. We all know that, uh, what, is it two years now ago, that the first stage of the Artemis program was launched and that was a spacecraft that went up, went up to the moon, circled around a few times and came back. 
And we've done this before, right? 50 years ago, we had this technology. But technology has changed so much. Computers have become so miniature compared to 50 years ago. We needed to do it again. We had to try it with no, no life form, no dog, no, rat, no monkey. No, just do it with that. The second stage, supposed to be next, end of next year. Four, uh, four astronauts, three guys and a woman, are going up. Same thing. Circle a few times, come back down. Don't land. Technology has to be tested on the humans first. The next stage is the fun one. That's when humans are going to land on the moon. So we don't know when that's going to happen. It might be, it might be five years. It, it would, NASA has to fund everything, and everything has to go right. We don't know when that's going to happen. But between now and then, there are other rockets going, going to the moon, and they're not ta telling us about them, but they're going up there and they're dropping these payloads of packages for the, when the people get there, they will have all the stuff they need and that will, to be able to set up a, an, a domed community. These are living inside domes and uh, completely everything that you do in, in a human community, you'll be doing inside the dome. So the people that go up to start an, uh, an uh, inhabitation are, have to have skill sets. They have to be able to fix things. They have to, be, have to do medical things. They have to everything. Bank, uh, bankers, maybe not. But <laughs> how, how about a supply room? Uh, when things go wrong, you have to be able to, to jury rig something to fi makes it make it fixed so it's going to be engineers every all kinds of walks of life people are going to be going. getting ready for that right now as we as I speak there is a community already I don't remember if it's Nevada or California that people have gone in there are people who are on the astronaut program who have gone in and they are spending a full year living inside a dome they have to come up with the, well, to, 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 to grow all their food, look after all the, the refuse, recycling, everything's done. They cannot leave there for a whole year. So that ho that's all, called terraforming. You're tr learning how to live in an, another environment. So that's coming up within the next, hopefully, five years. And um, think back 10 years. Think about the size of your computer at home. You had, a, you had a personal computer at home. Remember the size of the box? Remember the big clunky monitor? Think what you've got now. You've got more power in your cell phone now than you had in those computers. In 10 years from now, it's going to be even more, just on, on, a, uh, on a scale that's incredibly increasingly miniaturizing. So the technology in, fi in five, 10 years from now is going to be smaller, better, and the constraints within NASA is you've got, if you're going to send somebody up, humans up, you've got to provide all the life support systems and everything that they need in their community. That is weight. So they're going to have to find ways of manufacturing things on Mars. So the, the, the technology of how to make, take the, whatever elements they have on Mars and make things with it that they can make what they need to survive. Uh, so th that's, this, this mi miniaturization is what's coming in the, uh, the next 10 years that I see. And um, I think in regards to both of those, first, we had a, um, a lot of discussion within our, our group at, at TFA about, you know, what does it take to get things on the front page of the New York Times? And images and science are pretty good about getting on the front page of the New York Times. But putting a spectra on the front page of the New York Times is almost impossible. But if your spectra demonstrate that there's life on another planet, the New York Times will expend the effort to explain that spectrum to their audience, and that will be on the front page of the New York Times. So I, I, you know, I think that's, that's, you know, that's going to happen. The only way you're going to know is from spectroscopy. It has to happen. And so since the only way you're going to know is from spectroscopy, we're going to have to bring everybody along and figure out what does this spectrum mean because otherwise you're not appreciating you know, this, this wonderful discovery. And so, so there's a, a learning experience. From the solar physics side, I think you know, a fair bit of our science effort is going to be kind of doing 
the scientific support level to keep people alive in space. Because space weather is a huge hazard to biological life forms, especially outside of the protection of the Earth's magnetic magnetosphere, right? So low Earth orbit in, your, uh, in the space station, the Earth's magnetosphere helps you a lot. If you're on the moon, you're sometimes out of the Earth's protection. If you're at Mars, even the journey, even the journey is challenging. Um, so everything about it is hard. Uh, our forecasting skills are, you know, are limited so far. There's a lot of science we need to understand there to, to, because, you know, you may have the technology to do it, but unless, you know, you're only willing to send astronauts into you know, other planets during solar minimum or some other issue like that. Even in solar minimum, the galactic cosmic rays are a problem. So, you know, there are problems all over the spectrum there. And, uh, and so protection is, is going to be sort of the science of understanding protection, I guess, would be part of our, our biz. All right. Uh, we've, got some, we've got time for uh, some, some final questions. I, I see a hand over here. Molecules behave differently on Earth than they do in space, and how would we know that? I'm not sure who to ask that question of. Um, luckily, um, we have we have a periodic table, so we the building blocks of molecules we feel like we have a pretty good handle of, and then we spend a lot of time trying to simulate different conditions. It's a really good question, and actually. There's examples in the history of science where we saw something in the spectrum, we hadn't replicated those conditions on Earth quite yet, and so it was a bit of a mystery what it was. And there were periods of time when we may have thought we had found a new atom uh, or a new molecule, but it was actually a molecule, an atom we'd already known about, we just hadn't tested it in those conditions and identified its behavior in that way. That's a really great question. We're constantly trying to anticipate all those conditions and test for them. Um, uh, but often, uh, the limit, we're limited in our imagination sometimes. And that's one of the great things about science and observation is that those observations can force you outside of your, your box a little bit. Great, great. Uh, in the back of the room, gentlemen in the uh, hat. Great question. So uh, the question is, uh, do we, uh, have, have we been communicated with already? Is there uh, something top secret going on out there uh, that, uh, th that you, we're not being told about? Uh, I hear voices all the time, so <laughs> I'm going to just go with that. Um, I, one of my uh, undergraduate research uh, experiences was at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Socorro, New Mexico, and we uh, had to give tours of the VLA. Uh, the VLA is an acronym. Uh, I love astronomers' acronyms. Uh, the VLA stands for the Very Large Array. <laughs> we also have something called the VLT. That's the Very Large Telescope. So anyway, the VLA is in, in New Mexico, and it's, uh, it's uh, an array of radio dishes that are observing at radio wavelengths. Um, and the summer students were in charge of tours uh, at the VLA, and I often got this question, 
uh, partly because this was around the time uh, that the Contact, the movie Contact, was coming out, and the VLA plays a role in that in that film and the book. It's an excellent, excellent book uh, by Carl Sagan. Um, and um, uh, my response then is kind of similar to now in that um, I wasn't. Uh, no one told me. Yeah. So I uh, no one had informed me of anything. Um, I have been looking. Uh, at the night sky, I, will tra I travel the world, going to observatories, taking observations, looking, and I've never seen um, anything that would uh, make me think uh, that there was something uh, out there. My personal take is that if uh, there were, um, if we were being observed, uh, we'd all know about it. Like it would be something. It would be so um, at such a scale uh, that uh, we'd all be aware of it. Unlikely that um, e so my either we none of us know about it or we all know about it. I think it's very unlikely that uh, a few of us uh, have witnessed something. Um. I think that's code for yes, but we can't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Go, uh, gentlemen here. Oh, I love that's a great question, and it's something we should all talk about and think about because uh, it, it's coming. I think, um, as with a lot of scientific discoveries, it's not going to be um, immediately obvious right at the very beginning. What's more likely to occur is that there will be a suggestion, a sign of something in the spectrum that might be interpreted as a sign of disequilibrium in an exoplanet atmosphere, which might be caused by life, but there might be um, other reasons that, they, that, that may have appeared. There might be instrumental reasons where we need to consult with our team of engineers and data processors and make sure we have the data right. And then there are other explanations. There may be other things, kind of like the question earlier, there may be other natural non-life associated reasons that the signal may have appeared and we need to explore all of those so there what i think will happen is that there will be a claim uh that's that's out there and then there'll be a period of time it could be a decade it could be decades where we are scrutinizing that we're uh coming together and trying to fund and design a new telescope to test test it and really make sure um and then over the course of some time uh, we will come to some agreement, some consensus, uh, as scientists and a consensus as a community that this is truly uh, a signal. And then, um, and then there's a whole host of other questions to answer. Uh, is it simple life? Is it intelligent life? And if, there's, if there is intelligent life out there, then we have to bring in experts in all subjects uh, to talk about it and, and think about that. We have a question way at the end. Uh, yeah, so the question was about Umuruwa, the um, uh, object that entered the, the solar system uh, a few years ago, and um, Avi Loeb at uh, Center for Astrophysics, you know, mentioned that one possibility of this of explaining this object due to its 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 shape um, is that it could be an extraterrestrial object. I think that um, Avi presented that as a possibility, not as the most likely possibility, or even the in. Um, at explanation or the only explanation to, of that object, but um, he's he's um, he's Avi is a very careful scientist in many ways, and but he does, I think, tend to you know in articulating the range of possibilities, um, you know, the emphasis on on the extraterrestrial one tends to to be. Um, I don't, 
you know, I think the I haven't really looked into the to the to the papers related to that, but I think the um, the non extraterrestrial explanations for that are, are fairly. Uh, Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that's one example where a, a claim gets presented to the community, it's tested and scrutinized, and it does appear that uh, the motion that Oumuamua uh, has is, can be explained by outgassing from an icy cometary object, which we think it, it likely is. Question in the front. future astronomer here. Great question. Yeah, the question is why is there a collection of comets out at the very edge of our solar system? Um, and because uh, there's, there's three collections of small objects, uh, like asteroid or cometary size. One's the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. One is the Kuiper belt, which is uh, Pluto is an esteemed member of that group uh, <laughs> out, out beyond Neptune. But there's also something called the Oort cloud, which in, in, it's not a belt because it's a spherical distribution. Uh, and uh, we think that there's a large collection of comets out there. And this has to do with the rogue planet discussion um, and how we kick out objects through gravitational interactions. We think that a lot of these small bodies, which were probably very common early in the solar system, they had an interaction with a big, massive planet like Jupiter and got flung uh, out of the solar system. Now, when they're flung out, uh, they're flung in all directions. So that's why it has this spherical shape about it. We don't actually, we've never seen an object in the Oort cloud, like out there, um, but we see long period comets come in inner solar system, and we can reconstruct their orbits. So that's how we know, oh, that object actually spends a lot of time way out uh, in the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud extends almost a third of the distance to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. So it's, it's way uh, out there. But probably all stars have their own version of an, of an Oort cloud. Uh, and those are probably um, among the objects that Oumuamua is probably a uh, small cometary object that got flung out of the Oort cloud of, of another. There's one uh, uh, nice mathematical aspect. If you have something in a very elliptical orbit around the sun, it's going to spend the vast amount of its time away from the sun because it's moving really fast when it's coming by the sun and it's moving really slowly when it's at the other end. So if you just take a snapshot of all the things with these very highly elliptical orbits, they'll they'll all be essentially at, at far distances. Uh, the, the fraction of them that are going to be very close is going to be relatively small. So at the point there is getting it into the elliptical orbit is the tricky bit, right? And that is from the interaction with this, with heavy, this heavy mass. And once you get it into the elliptical orbit, then it, by nature, is going to spend its time far away from you, from the sun. All right, well, big day tomorrow. Uh, we have time for one more question, so let's... Oh, <laughs> of course. Nice. Well, if there's, uh, let me, I'm going to start by saying that, Seth, and I, we're going to jam after this uh, <laughs> session tonight. Uh, but uh, th so. So the question is, there's music in space. And I, I, I'll answer that by saying uh, that, it, that that phrase, uh, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a noise or does it make a sound? Well, it makes a sound. We know that because that's just physics. It's vibration. Does it make a noise? Well, noise is interpretive. What's noise to one person might be music to another. So in space, there's no sound necessarily. But uh, there's, there are musicians in the world who believe that music is comprised equally of silence as there is. So to say that there is no music in space would uh, disregard.
respect those composers who believe in the silence of uh, of music. So uh, that's that's how I'll I'll phrase that uh, answer as a non-answer. <laughs> I'll say I'll give a little Wesleyan story. Uh, John Cage, who's a famous American uh, composer. Uh, spent some time at Wesleyan and came up to the observatory and took a star chart that had just been published, um, put some musical staffs on it, and composed a piece uh, called Atlas Eclipticalis um, at, at our observatory using the star chart as the basis for the music. So I think that's uh, so cool. And um, what I love about art in general, um, but music too, that's so mathematical, um, is how it can uh, weave between science and art uh, in really amazing and interesting ways. So I enjoy seeing artists interpreting concepts of the universe and scientists um, kind of creating music or other artwork from the data that they're gathering. I find it really fascinating. And I should mention for those of you that are uh, Spotify fans that we do have a, a Totality and Tupper Spotify playlist going which is all themed based on planets or, or the universe and so forth. Um, so uh, please check that out, Adirondack Sky Center uh, is the playlist. It won't be any easier or harder than it would be at any other time. I mean, it's thoughts uh, as you you know have a pair of binoculars handy uh, away from the sun. Sorry, Tim. Actually, going to be just up to the upper left of the eclipse when it's in totality. If you've got really good eyesight, it should be just uh, I don't know maybe. A, a couple of fingers widths up to the left. Yeah. Ah. Uh, well, I can tell you that uh, as the former superintendent of the school district, uh, 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 the, the lights go on at the school, but uh, I had some pull, and uh, we've disabled the circuits that they're on, so <laughs> it's not my first eclipse. <laughs> so uh, just to uh, just kind of circle back to uh, the question, what keeps us up at night? What keeps me up uh, at night is that, uh, that nobody will come to Tupper Lake and see what a fabulous community we have here and enjoy the festivities tomorrow and, and not get a chance to experience the, uh, this, this amazing event that we've put together as a community uh, for our visitors. And with the hope that uh, they'll you know, experience some, some crowds and have some difficulty getting home. And, and I hope that they uh, you know, maybe get a little chilled and say, hey, we should come back here during the summer when it's warmer. That's, that's, uh, my, that's my fear, that they, that they don't take the chance and come. Can I just say, I just wanted to thank Seth and board members of the Adirondack Sky Center for putting in all the work that you've done to make this such a great uh, weekend. So thank you so much. With that, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. I want you to have a fantastic uh, eclipse day tomorrow, uh, regardless of what happens up there in the sky. Uh, it, it's going to be uh, an unbelievable experience if you haven't had one already. And even if it's your second or 20th, it's, it's still amazing every single time. So enjoy every minute of it. And uh, don't forget to be around somebody that you love and, uh, and, and be part of that. So I want to thank our guests tonight. Thank you so much for being here and uh, taking part in the discussion. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.